In this episode, we will talk about how to mimic human metabolism in mice. For example, neurons, glia. Let's talk pharmacokinetics for antibody development. Following the transplantation of hematopoietic cells. Let's talk how to test if your drug induces a cytokine storm. Welcome to Jack's Tech Talk with the technical information scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. Welcome to episode number 64 of our JAX Tech Talk. Let's talk HET3 mice, a genetically diverse model to study mammalian aging. JAX Tech Talk is a monthly podcast style webinar where we explore topics that our customers frequently ask about. For anyone watching live, you'll notice that the chat is disabled, but please submit your questions through the Q&A button. I'm Kat Chappelle, one of the Jackson Laboratory's technical information scientists. My role is to serve the research community by providing research education and offering technical solutions and answers to all of your inquiries. Some of you may recognize me from contacting our group or from attending one of our webinars. At the end of 2022, Jax was happy to announce that we now offer the HET3 model up to 52 weeks of age and soon we'll have mice up to 90 weeks of age. The HET3 is a very popular model for studies that look at the effects of aging, health span, and longevity. I'm very excited to be joined by aging expert, Dr. David Harrison, to discuss the HET3 model and its role in aging research. Dr. Harrison is an expert in genetics of aging and longevity, seeking to understand the basic mechanisms of aging and working to promote healthful aging in humans. Dave has more than a decade of experience working with the HET3 model, as well as being part of the National Institute of Aging's intervention testing program that works to identify agents that significantly increase median lifespan. Please join me in welcoming Dave. How are you this morning, Dave? My thanks. Ready to go. Awesome. Um, can you start by briefly introducing what the HET3 model is? So the mice are genetically heterogeneous. That's very important. But they're made heterogeneous. That is having two different alleles that um, many loci. They're made heterogeneous in a reproducible fashion. They're the first generation from a cross between BALB C, B6, F1 hybrids, and C3H, DBA2, F1 hybrids. Now, since every inbred strain is homozygous at all the alleles, their F1 hybrids are also genetically identical. So that means that we only have one mother and one father genetically. Therefore, the whole HET3 population are siblings. If you breed 10,000 of these matings together and make 100,000 mice out of them, they're all sibs. They tend to be, well, in my belief, so far, they're the best mouse model available for the clinic for people because of this genetic heterogeneity, which is yet reproducible. Um, so the C57 black 6 J mouse is also a really popular aging model, but the HET3 was included in the National Institute of Aging's intervention testing program. Could you talk a bit about why this strain was chosen over B6? Yes, and as a matter of fact, we have a nice slide on that too. And feel free to take a screenshot of the slides so you don't have to take the notes. Benefits of the B6. Many published studies that B6 has been the standard aging model for quite a long time. Another benefit is no genetic diversity. Of course, that makes experiments more repeatable or, or supposed to. And if you're doing transplantation experiments, suppose you want to know whether an old organ or an old bone marrow works just as well as young bone marrow if it's in a young mouse, then you really do have to have the animals histocompatible. But it has some fairly serious drawbacks. <laughs> no genetic diversity. That's different. And most seriously, any inbred strain is going to have rare late-acting deleterious recesses because they're homozygous at all alleles. And because each inbred strain has its own set of rare deleterious recessives, as well as the standard rare deleterious recessives that are in the population, that makes them a poor model for the clinic 
because they're not representative of a of a real population. Also, they lack well, we call it hybrid vigor, but it's a it's just not having not being homozygous at every allele. It turns out B sixes are surprisingly healthy and long lived, and that's because many inbred strains were made, and and they turn out to be the best ones. Um. So, Dave, when designing HET3 study or studies with HET3, what are the best ages, cohort sizes, and controls that you would need to take into consideration to maintain statistical significance? To understand how many mice you need to use, you need to do a power analysis. And the power analysis can't be done unless you have a pretty good idea of the variance in your measure. Often you have to do experiments where you don't know what the variance is in the measure because it's the first time it's being measured in your conditions, at least, with a particular model you're using. So my, uh, my tactic in these cases is to use as many mice as I can, but not all in one experiment. If you use them all in a single experiment and something some little thing is fouled up, you're going to miss it. So I like to make sure the experiments are repeated at least once and preferably two or three times if the findings are really exciting. But you all know, or you all should be able to find out what a power analysis is. Once you have an idea of what the variance is, then there are simple calculations that tell you how many animals you need to use to have the power to detect changes at different levels of significance. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, so when we met the other day, you had highlighted some consider considerations for the environment and handling of HET3 mice in order to maintain integrity of the strain for use in and during aging studies. I would love if you could touch on that again for our viewers. Okay. We want to go to that slide, please. So if you're going to study mouse aging, and hopefully most of you already know this, but if there's somebody here that doesn't know it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over it anyway. If you're going to study mouse aging, you really need to avoid pathogens. The animal room must be pathogen-free and tested often. This is because the older animals are likely to be more vulnerable to pathogens. And so you, what you think is a change with age is actually a change with the excess vulnerability to the pathogen in the old animals. And people have made this mistake a great deal in the past, but there's no excuse for it now. How do you keep the room pathogen free? Well, one thing you use high efficiency filters, you use pause to pressure in the room, multiple air changes, temperature and humidity has to be optional, optimal. The uh, way to handle a mouse room is very well defined. And for that matter, Jackson Laboratory can give you details on how this should be done. The diet has to be clean, pathogen-free. Water has to be clean. And it's important that the diet and the water be as reproducible as possible. In the animal room, the people who are working there should always wear gowns, shoes, and a clean mask. Why is that? Well, because there is some bacteria that can affect mice that we carry <laughs> routinely, which which don't affect us. We don't want to get the mice sick, especially when they're old, become more vulnerable to bacteria when they're old. Handle mice with kindness. I hope you all like mice. If you're working with mice, I hope you enjoy them and you realize that they're, they're um, that despite their tiny size and their low point on the food chain, they're fairly intelligent and they certainly can be stressed. And if you stress the mice by not being gentle and kind to them, that fouls up your experiment. So you don't handle them with kindness just because you're a nice person. You handle them with kindness because you want to get reproducible experiments. Finally, mice should be multiply housed because mice are social animals and housing a single mouse by itself, uh, it stresses them and it bores them. And, uh, it's the simplest way to, to deal with this is to just have several mice together. Unfortunately, sometimes, especially with males, they fight. 
So then you have to watch it. And of course, if they're cutting each other up, then you're going to have to separate the mice. Now, this is a very, very basic, very, very quick run through. And if anything here looks strange or you're surprised at it, you really need to see a veterinarian who's expert on dealing with aging mice before you try to have aging mice. Because unless the aging mice are handled properly, minimize stress, it's going to foul up the experiment. By foul up, I mean it's going to make the experiment unreproducible. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of people don't consider that stress can be a large factor in reproducibility of studies. And I think you bring up a really, really good point. Um, so what are some of the advantages and drawbacks of the HEP3 model? Okay, well, we have a slide for that. Again, so you can take a screenshot and you don't have to. Uh... Okay, so the benefits, it's the best clinical model. Well, I think it's the best clinical model. Other people have, have clinical models, but this one has a good deal of genetic variability and it's reproduced. It has only the rare, it has only the late acting deleterious recessives that are common to the four inbred strains that, that are the parental strain or grandparental strains. And that means it's much more like a human population. It has a hybrid vigor. It's not homozygous to every Leo. It, it, there's not as many results as there are with Black 6, but the numbers of published studies are rapidly increasing because the intervention testing program uses them. Uh, more and more people have begun to use them. And heck, you can use them to test if the results you already got with Black 6 mice are actually valid for a genetically heterogeneous population. What are the drawbacks? There are a couple big drawbacks. One is this more genetic variability, and that means, of course, they're more the variance may be higher. You'll have to deal with that in your power analysis. It's not always higher. Sometimes the hybrid vigor gives you better regulation of things so that the HAT3 model may not be more variable than the inbred strain. But you have to test that in your own specific system. And finally, you can't use them for tissue transplant, where you're testing whether the old tissue is inherently defective or its environment is defective and you transplant the old tissue to a, to a young mouse. You can't do this across the HET3 because every one of them is a genetic individual with different major histocompatibility alleles. So for that, you're stuck with uh, an inbred strain or I would, I would suggest a F1 hybrid, a single F1 hybrid. Thank you, Dave. Um, so you mentioned the rare late acting deleterious recessives quite a bit. Um, for those of our viewers who aren't sh sure what those are or why they're important, could you tell us a bit about that? Please, yes. I, I this is this is the key reason not to use inbred strains as a clinical model. So can we have the uh, slide for the? Uh, there we go. All right. So if you're studying aging, you probably know uh, why, you know the evolutionary explanation of aging. But just if you think about it, why do we age at all? Over a billion years of selection for life on Earth, wouldn't aging have anything deleterious have been, been long removed, even if most of the time it's not important because you're already dead before it begins to act. Still, why wasn't it removed? Okay, number one, for species in its niche, lifespan is limited by its environment, right? By its predation, by its chance of accidents, by its chance of getting catching illnesses and so forth. And the species die, the individuals die off over over their life over the lifespan of the the species so that everybody doesn't live the longest possible lifespan. Reproduction, therefore, earlier in life is, is more advantageous than later because you're likely to still be alive then. Late-acting deleterious recessives are not removed if the deleterious effect doesn't occur until the individual is likely to have already died of something else. It can't be removed under those circumstances because the only way you, evolution can get rid of deleterious mutations is for them to be expressed at a time when they affect reproduction. 
So if you're already past your reproductive lifespan and something gets bad and, and does bad things to you, evolution can't get rid of it for you. Yep, makes sense. Even worse, if a mutation, which can be quite deleterious later in life, helps you reproduce early, like for example, the cells that can reproduce really fast in the breast in the mammal in order to produce milk and the prostate in the male in order to produce semen. Uh, well, we have a lot of problems with breast cancer and prostate cancer, but when do they occur? They occur after our ancestors have already died or at least no longer be reproductive. So the mutation, even though it causes problems late in life, if it, if it benefits reproduction early, it's selected for. Finally, in an inbred strain, because they're homozygous at every allele, rare late-acting deleterious recessives are actually expressed. And these would be the rare, not just those that most members of the species have, but those that are unique to each inbred strain. And that means it doesn't age in the same way. It doesn't get natural problems with aging in the same way as the rest of the members of the species. And this is what makes the poor model for normal population, like the human clinical population. If you want more information on that, there's a great deal of fascinating research on this uh, that's come out in, in a wide range of models, not just mice, but also yeast and fruit flies and nematodes. There's a lot of genetic research on, on aging. And uh, we had asked for some of those references from you with more of a focus on HET3 um, that was sent out with registration. So um, our viewers should definitely check that out. And, and, I, and I remind people again that if you, if you have further questions, uh, not just me, you've got, you've got the whole Jackson Laboratory and not just uh, the mouse part. There's a group in Connecticut that tends to have a lot of expertise in human human genetics as well. So you've got the whole Jackson Laboratory to, to get information from. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. Um, I did want to remind our, um, our viewers that if you wanted to submit questions, you'll have to do that through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions for Dave now. Um, the first one is, the ITP has tested many interventions using the HET3 model. Could you tell us about one you know of that has been very impactful? <laughs> well, my favorite is rapamycin. Uh, rapamycin is um, increases the lifespan uh, about a quarter, about 25% for the median lifespan and maybe a little bit less for the maximum, but considerably maybe 20% for the maximum lifespan. And it works best in females. Most of our interventions work best in males. So it's nice to have one which works best in females. Why do I say that? Well, it's because HET3 males don't live as long as HET3 females. So it's possible they have some sort of problem, which is not really aging, which can be fixed and increase their lifespan. Whereas if it works in both males and females, we, we have this warm, fuzzy feeling that it probably really is retarding aging. And there's a lot of information that's come out now on rapamycin and aging. And I think, in fact, the reference list included a couple of references on that. Yeah, it definitely did. Um, so I would encourage our viewers, again, to, to go ahead and check that out. Well, what you should do, actually, actually if you're interested, sorry. <laughs> Please, if you're interested in the ITP, just enter into your, your search program on your computer, NIA space. ITP. And then you get the Intervention Testing Program website, which is quite a helpful website. It has all the papers that we've written over the 20 years the program has been in, act, been in, in focus, and, and it, it provides you with uh, a great deal of information about all the interventions that have been tested. Interestingly, although we try very hard to choose interventions that have a good probability of increasing lifespan, most of them don't, which suggests that uh, we really don't know everything there is to know about what increases lifespan. However, every time you test something, 
and it doesn't work, that gives you some valuable information too. You're absolutely right. A negative results are still results. That's right. And the, the ITP does publish all our negative results as well as our positive results. Of course, That's now on the other hand, you can fail to find, something can fail to increase lifespan because we haven't used an optimal dose or because we've not given it the right time or we tend to give everything in the food. Maybe it has to be injected. So there's, uh, there's other reasons why um, something can fail to increase lifespan. But we've got enough things that do increase lifespan, enough things that are interesting besides rapamycin. For example, a carbose is very interesting. A carbose decreases the rate of, of I mean, increases the rate of, of, of carbohydrate passage through, through the system. So it's um, uh, almost, we, we expect it to be almost like food restriction. But really, if you compare the, the way the animals age, and looking at biomarkers of various kinds, neither a carbose nor rapamycin really seem to be that much like dietary restriction. So they, these are these have interesting effects. And then another very, very good one is 17-alpha estrogen. 17, I mean, estradiol. 17-alpha estradiol is supposedly a non-feminizing estrogen. And uh, with age, by, by middle age, females stop cycling in, in, in the mouse population. So we had hoped giving them estrogen would would in, would improve their lifespans. It doesn't. This doesn't help females at all. It, however, has great benefits for males. <laughs> it's That's uh, really interesting. Yeah, it is interesting, and it, it the, the sex differences, the sex differences are 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 something that are, are definitely worth studying because there's a lot of sex differences in how interventions affect the aging processes in both males and females in the HET3 mice. Well, thank you so much, Dave. That is all the time that we have for today. And we do appreciate all of our viewers checking in with us. If we didn't get to your question today, uh, please feel free to send it to us at micetech at jacks.org. And we'll make sure that we can get to that. Um, Dave, is there anything you wanted to say before we go? No, I'm, I'm, uh... The big thing is to remember that, that there's a lot of people who can help you at the Jackson Laboratory who are highly competent. Thank you so much, Dave, again. And thank you all for joining us today for episode 64.